it's been 20 years. So I am celebrating my 20th year anniversary. Uh, and I can't even begin to say how this education has shaped me. And all the conversations, especially from the presenters, the earlier part of this morning, I have been hungry for this conversation and didn't realize it. I have really discovered, I think, you know, sometimes people call me, that they, they say I'm a theologian now these days, but I don't see myself that way because it's such a formal term. I'm clearly someone, I see myself as a social scientist, one who has a, a spirit of curiosity and inquiry and I think it's important for all of us, however we are, wherever we are, whatever profession, to maintain that kind of sense of inquiry about life, about issues, about things that matter to us, about injustice, all of the above. And I also want to say I really now am standing inside of being an Asian American woman. Uh, I want to say up front, yes, it's really a big deal for me because when I went to PSR 20 years ago, and I have deep gratitude for all of the scholarships. I want to, I was able to do my four years of PSR on scholarship. Now that is a major accomplishment. And I have to just say a few words about that because I received things from Shelby Rooks and the churches and uh, as an Asian American woman, I didn't know that was like a big deal. Here in Hawaii, we don't quite have the same viewpoints around racism that uh, you do on the continent. And I just want to speak to that, not as any kind of judgment, but just it's a different reality here. And so the blessings for me is having grown up already in this multicultural environment. It was just normal, you know, Japanese, Chinese, Portuguese. I mean, whether you're Italian, Jew or what, African-American, white, I mean, it was like normal. We all just, you know, we ate each other's food. We played together. I mean, it was so I'm going to dive right in by saying when I read the book Cast, which I'm sure some of you know, it's Isabel Wilkerson. If you have not yet read it, you must add it to your I'm sorry, I'm being so kind of more assertive than usual here, but. It's that kind of book that offers us a lens to understand this huge history of 400 years that our country is still dealing with. And it's a huge spiritual wounding, I'm gonna say. It is a trauma. Hi, Margaret, and welcome. Um, I'm just have dived in here so uh, because of our time constraints. And hi, Christine, welcome. Hello. Hi. I'm I think I'm supposed to be in another breakout room to help facilitate. So I'm leaving, but I hope to hear your presentation some other time. I apologize. Okay, yeah. Well, and also because I think the themes and the points, hi, Tino and Michael, um, I, I'm not going to do my usual introduction because we're already into the 15 minutes or so I have. Um, the story of Hawaii and the exploitation and the cultural genocide that has taken place which I wasn't really aware of, you know, these things, unless you're right in the trenches. I mean, many of us are just oblivious. You know, we have ways to protect ourselves and to buffer ourselves from the reality of how others are living. So in many ways, this is a story of how the native Hawaiians, and we could also include the native American Indians, almost any indigenous group, whether it's Australia and, um, um, you know, it, the story has repeated itself throughout history, let's just say. So in the book cast, and it was so illuminating for me and why I wanted to bring it to this particular event and audience is that I think each of us in our ministries and our communities are dealing with these issues. Yes, it's social justice, but then it gets very specialized in terms of your own neighborhood or community. And I really had a major awakening, you know, and I think we all consider ourselves pretty well informed. I'm pretty awake. I'm not like a, you know, I'm not a totally woke person because I think that's an evolution and a process. But, you know, I do my best to really stay up to date with what's happening. And especially with those who are less fortunate, who are disenfranchised. Anyway, <laughs> in the book, Cast, Isabel Wilkerson, who is a brilliant African-American, she's won the New York 
She's a bestseller. She's an author. Um, I was recommending that if you have not yet added it to your list, please do, because she talks about so many things that are impacting us now, but it's the trauma of the past. And whether or not you're African-American, believe me, it still impacts each and every one of us. So, um, and uh, forgive me if I'm not too coherent, because this is a very passionate topic for me. I'm going to ask Shannon to please put up the first slide, Diamond Head. And I want to ask, how many of you have even been to Hawaii or have seen pictures of Hawaii and the beautiful beaches? Well, practically everyone. Well, this is the view from my balcony. Can you still hear me? Hello, just nod your head. Yeah, please. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay. And I mean, I I have the pleasure of the beauty, uh, just diamond head, thank you, I, the, of this enormous beauty. This is my, my therapy, everyone, that I get to have this every day, the ocean, the mountains, the sky. So most of us come to Hawaii, I think, with this idea of it is paradise. And in many ways it is. And yet at the same time, there is a dark side. So uh, Shannon, could you put up the other slide, the Hawaiian? Um, what is it? Okay, so thank you. What what does it mean to be Hawaiian? Why is it so difficult with the t-shirt? Can you go back to that for a minute, Shannon? Thank you. I would just invite you to take a moment to read this quote it's actually on a t-shirt why is it so hard to be hawaiian in hawaii and i hope you can maybe begin to hear some of the not only sarcasm but perhaps some of the despair in this question it gets to the core the hawaiians are at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder in hawaii these are the original peoples when captain cook arrived with a very quick history. I'm not going to go into all of it. And especially when Hiram Bingham, who was one of the earliest missionaries, and I read the first sources, the first, and I want to thank PSR because if it weren't for the, my UCC history class, I wouldn't have known this. In that arrival of these early missionaries, when they first viewed the native Hawaiians on the shores and on the beaches, he wrote that they looked like savages. They were primitive. I was shocked. I went, oh my God. I mean, this is the viewpoint because they were operating from that whole doctrine. Most of you know the manifest destiny, which is became that doctrine, a mandate that gave them the rationalization and justification to, to, to take the lands, to plunder. Um, you, most of you I'm sure know the whole the story of what happened with the Native American Indians we can translate that over into the native Hawaiians. Now, I have this picture of this couple. They're Micronesians. That's another example of the colonialism. We don't have the time and space to go into that, but he was wearing this t-shirt. I happened to do an afternoon walk. It's part of my therapy and my exercise program in my neighborhood park. And he was doing a barbecue, which you can see, it smelled so good. I have to say, I walked over. Now we just struck up a conversation because in Hawaii, you kind of talk to everybody. They welcomed me and invited me to join them for dinner with their three children. This was just not only an expression of, we could say the Christian spirit of inclusivity, and yet it was also the Aloha spirit. And here he is wearing this t-shirt. So for me, I'm just saying that moment was like a light bulb of just so many contradictory things going on. So you can take those down, um, Shannon, for now. Um, anyway, I just wanted to give you that illustration and I'm gonna jump for a minute to the first pillar here because I think the colonialism, I could sum it up in saying it was all about trauma, historical trauma a spiritual wounding. And then in the afternoon session, I will talk about the spiritual healing because I don't want to leave you in, in doom and despair that there have been many creative, proactive things that the native Hawaiian community is doing to counterbalance, to push back, to reclaim their cultural integrity and identity and wholeness. So um, pillar one, let me just mention that one for a minute. 
which is a going back to um, the book cast is called divine will. And in fact, Shannon, could you just put up the book cast for a moment and the eight pillars? And I'm sorry, we have to fast track it through this, but um, you, you guys are, I'm sure this is life these days. So the book cast, which you may or may not be familiar with, please take a screenshot if you will, or just Google her later. And then the next, the eight pillars, you can at least see the first. We don't have time to do all eight, but divine will and the laws of nature. Okay, you could take that down now. So this was the justification and the mandate that the early missionaries used to literally rain havoc and how it shows up in terms of the way the native peoples became colonialized eventually first of all the language was outlawed the children were moved into missionary schools their hair was cut their hawaiian names were obliterated and replaced with western names like bob or janice or bob even within the chinese community my mother's and my my aunties my parents generation all have english names but they didn't have them originally they were all chinese names my mother's name kam lin was became bertha excuse me that's a rather german name i think for an asian woman so there's all these um it, it, one ends up anyway having a rather disjointed understanding of really your own personal identity but getting back to the clash of values that eventually has evolved over time and history um with the divine will as the first pillar it just gave them the right quote unquote the right to to abuse emotionally economically um <clears throat> i didn't want to just throw statistics at you but when the first missionaries arrived, just to give you an idea, there were 900,000 people on the islands is our, our most current estimate. That's almost a million people. But the thing to important to think to realize is we were, we had food sufficiency. There was enough food to feed everyone from taro to sweet potatoes. They had a brilliant engineering system, uh, agricultural system from the mountains down to the oceans. Now, why is this important? Because every decade there was a decimation in the population with all the white man's diseases, tuberculosis, smallpox, measles. And again, I didn't want to inundate you with um, you know, statistics, but eventually it got down to there's only about 45,000 native Hawaiians. That just gives you an idea. And in this 21st century, from, you know, let's just say 2020, this decade of the 21st century, we are dependent. 90% of our food now has to be imported and brought in. So we are slaves to this whole system. I mean, and, and whenever, so I'm just pointing to the disparity this huge economic disparity of from food self-sufficiency, which is what the islands now are striving to re um, to reclaim and to recover, but it's a major uphill battle. Um, if I may, another example of colonialism, whether you have read about it in the news, but this whole idea of, you know, for most indigenous people, again, including the Native Americans, land is considered sacred. It is a sacred ancestor, but to the West and even with the early missionaries, the, the idea was always ownership and possession. There is not a word in the Hawaiian language for possession and ownership that gives you an idea. For them, it's a shared resource. It's for everyone. It is for the community. So Mauna Kea, which many of you know, is one of the most beautiful places on the big island. It is also the site of some of the world's largest telescopes so we have the world of science which has taken priority and has privilege over sacred land indigenous rights 
And it has become, I'm sure many of you, if you were following it, it was just a, a massive demonstration, which unfortunately turned violent from time to time. Uh, but it's a clear example where we can see on a public stage, on a world stage, the clash of values. Is land a commodity to be sold and owned for profit and power? Or is it sacred land to be honored for spiritual practices and cultural beauty and wealth? It's a different way to measure wealth. So um, I think I'm winding down because, again, of our time constraint. Um, I did want to leave some time here for about 10, 15 minutes of interaction. So Shannon, I think I'll turn it over to you. If And I, I know, by the way, I kind of sped through this and um, hope you could follow me as best as you could. Uh, firstly, Jade, you did an amazing job. Uh, Michelle, Michelle actually handled your slides for your presentation today. Oh, thank it you. went it went very smoothly. Very oh, good. smoothly. Thank you. Um, and just, I just wanted to say briefly, um, your ancestors' experience. Um, I I give my empathy to that, um, and whatever trauma that has caused in your DNA, uh, in knowing that they lived through those challenges. Um, my God, what a resilient people! What yes. a resilient people! and you are the manifestation of all of their dreams. Your ministry is more than just ministry, Jade. You are the living proof that your people made it through. It's a heavy mantle to carry, but you're doing extremely well. Thank you so much for sharing today. Thank you so much for that. God bless you. God bless you. I wanna to talk to you more outside of the PSR meeting, but you are a beautiful being. And I thank you for welcoming your ancestors into this space and trusting us with being able to, to experience them through you. Thank you for that. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Jade? Before, before, before that though, Shannon, I just have to quickly respond, which is first of all, thank you for seeing who I am. Another part of me that I'm still healing and, um, when I, you know, it's like your own discovery when you discover your ancestral past and then you really are responsible to include it all. Just briefly, so many of you, I'm sure know, you know, in the Chinese history, women had bound feet. So both of my grandmothers, which is not that far away in terms of years, had bound feet. They each had about nine children. This is before, you know, Lama's. I mean, uh, this is before anesthesia, before any of those things that we have in terms of modern science. So I just, in my own process of discovery and to take all of that dark history and transform it so that it can make a difference and can be part of our healing for really all of us. Because this isn't just my story, as I'm so clear about. This is the story of many, many of us. So thank you. If, if you could also add to that, and I'm curious to know, I'm sure we all are, how has your relationship, your healed relationship with your ancestors impacted your ministry? Oh, well, well, <clears throat> it has to do with what I'm going to call pain and suffering. We've all experienced pain and suffering in different ways, whether it's a physical injury, emotionally, uh, maybe there was abuse of some form in your past or not with you directly, but your ancestors. And then whether you, if you have any sense of that, it does get passed down. It's a very complicated thing, but here in, I'm just gonna say in, in the Hawaiian islands and elsewhere, you know, this is why we see some of the problems uh, and it shows up in the prisons. You know, our, our prison system here in Hawaii is full of young men of, of native Hawaiian ancestry in the same way that the prisons on the continent are full of mostly African-American men or men of color, Latinos. So, um, and, and you know, I'm sure you've all done enough research and understanding how that happens. So, but what I have seen, Shannon, is part of what, what somehow my gift and my calling has been 
also for some of you who don't know me, I do hospice work. So there's whatever the form of loss is. Have I always lived? Uh, no, I've lived on the East Coast and the West Coast. I lived in Southeast Asia and Singapore. I've worked in New York and I've worked in Paris. So I have, I feel the benefit of some really diverse experiences and I'm very grateful for that. But um, that however painful and dark that history is, it can be healed and transformed. So it can become a gift. And it, I have experienced it for myself, having had many losses and adversity in my life. And yes, what you're seeing here, though, is a woman now who has dealt with it, though. And you need to be willing to lean into it as, um, what's her name? You know, the CEO of Facebook or the vice CEO. Um you know, we need to lean into that dark past. And I think even we as a Christian faith need to lean into our own dark histories where we have done wrong, where we have perpetrated a lot of injustice in the world. So I'll just say that, period. God bless you for that. And your chaplaincy also, this breathing into the bodies that are passing on and by sharing their stories so that they continue on even after they've passed. Um, with that being said, if anyone has any questions for Jade or any comments to make, uh, the floor is now open. Uh, I served as the pastor of Yao United Church of Christ on Maui, Hawaii for five years. And uh, everything that Jade has mentioned, uh, it's a repeat. Uh, and one of the things that I would also add is the idea of uh, Mahu. Uh, mahu is the similar word uh, that we use here for two-spirit people, uh, LGBTQ plus people here on the continent. And Hawaii does not consider this the mainland. Hawaiians uh, call uh, the United States as the continent. Yes. Because to consider the mainland means that they agree with the overthrow of the kingdom. Uh, and so uh, many Hawaiians, especially the youth in Hawaii, uh, they come to the continent and they stay here because uh, it is too expensive to live in Hawaii. They, they can't sustain to stay in Hawaii. And so many of the youth that I, uh, uh, I saw leave the islands, they never return. The only time they return is when they have to go back to take care of their elderly parents. Uh, uh, of the uh, kapuna. Uh, and it's that same idea that we are Christians, we're here to save you. Uh, you need to get rid of your uh, ancestry way of thinking. You need to get rid of your mahus, uh, 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 you, everything. Uh, and it's just a repeating of colonialism. Um, so uh, thank you, Jade, for bringing that. Uh, I, I am right there with you because I know exactly what uh, yeah. Hawaiian people have gone through uh, by the stories. Again, Hawaiian people are like the Native American people. They are storytellers. Mm -hmm. uh, when they say, let's talk story, uh, they have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jade. Thank you, Tino. And I also would like to extend just a gracious um, acknowledgement if this has stepped on anyone's toes. Uh, this is not an easy topic. It's a very difficult topic even to talk about it. But I think we need to address, uh, and I hope in a healthy environment, some of these issues because they are glaring, really. Um, we don't have the word ghetto here. We don't use that, that we might, you know, if we lived in Harlem or the East Coast, but we have our form of ghetto and it's the Waianae Coast. And it is drugs and violence and guns. I mean, you could be standing, you don't want to stand on a street corner. You're going to get a stray bullet. I mean, it is like, that's the reality. And Tino, I'm glad you mentioned even the word mahu, it's, capital M-A-H-U, it's the Hawaiian word for what we would call perhaps gay people, although it generally refers more to the men than the women. And and the thing the, to be aware of, though, is in the Hawaiian native culture, it was never considered bad. 
you were not an evil person. In fact, the space of Hawaiian culture embraces the notion that, you know, there is diversity, there is difference, and you are a beautiful human being. You know, whatever gender or expression you are choosing. So I'm going to say, you know, there's um, aloha. Unfortunately, I hate, I have a he hesitancy to use that word because it's gotten so commodified. But uh, it really was in the early days an expression of that welcoming, we embrace you. So just wanted to say that. Thank you for that. We, we have about a minute and 43 seconds as the clock is ticking down. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? I would just like to say thank you for sharing uh, your story and you know, the contents of your heart. And of course, uh, I, I know a lot of the history myself. And I just, you know, having gone to PSR and if many of us who have stood in that chapel and look at that uh, commissioning of the di disciples, it's very white and it involves the Hawaiian Islands blatantly. Um, you know, as a, a, a well, part of a denomination or de several denominations and a school that is part of that missionary system that went and uh, uh, perpetrated this in Hawaii, what might we be thinking of at PSR in our fearlessness uh, toward making uh, restitution or restoration, however you want to name it, because yes. uh, the fact that there are churches there and that we are there is is yes. a, a result of the annexation and all the things that have gone on, uh, you know, oh, the overthrowing of their own sovereignty. Yes. Um, so uh, I think that would be something that we are uh, being called to do then. Wow. Thank you, Michael. You must have seen my outline. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I really appreciate your bringing this up because and no. if I may take the last couple of minutes to say something about that. Yeah. Uh, I, first of all, thank you all for being here and for your willingness to even engage with this topic. It's not easy. And also thank you, Tino and PSR and David and all of you really for the work that you're doing. I mean, you know, PSR is a very unique place. Time, oh, time up, come on. Um, well, you know, we can it's continue. Not fair. Yeah, it's not fair for sure. This is an, uh, this is injustice. Uh, but uh, we can chat. First of all, I'm going to leave my email in the chat for those of you who would like to stay in touch. And then also, I'm hoping this can become a course and I want to teach it. That and would be so, great. Yeah. And I, and I invite any of you to participate with me because this is, this is a village. It takes a village. It takes a team. And if we're going to transform the world or our communities or our churches, we need each other. Amen and hallelujah.